Okay. I am changing the order a little bit. I'm going to be talking in general first, then about the impact. And maybe while we are in the session of uh, questions and answers, then I will have some slides going by showing you the progress of the project. Because the progress of the project is, is kind of boring, at least to people that are more interested in the impact. You know, it's just a lot of earth and movement and a lot of trucks moving dirt. <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of people have said that the expansion of the canal is a game changer. But Panama has been really a game changer for many, many years. Uh, it was at the beginning, and this goes back to early, uh, late 19th century, when uh, the construction of the first transition railroad took place. Uh, it was really the first intermodal system in, in the Americas. Uh, it was, of course, solving a problem, and that was for people to be able to move from the east to the west coast the Gold Rush. Uh, and uh, of course, if they would move by boat, they would then take a railroad, cross by land, and then take another boat to go to the West Coast. Uh, that company, Panama Canal Railroad, the Panama Railroad, I mean, was really one of the most profitable, if not the most profitable company in the stock exchange in New York. Uh, they managed in those days. Think of how much that would represent today. To charge $25 uh, dollars in gold to move from one ocean to the other by rail. $25. Dollars. And they would charge $5 for you to walk it. So you can see the value that that, uh, that had for, for not only the development of California, but also the development of, of uh, intermodalism. The next uh, game changer, of course, was the construction of the Panama Canal, which followed the failure of the Suez. I mean, uh, Belatetz had just completed the construction of the Suez Canal, and then he thought it was going to be as easy to build a sea level canal in Panama. And uh, as, as that failed, of course, then they had to uh, sell the stock and try to get somebody to buy it. And the United States came through, and they bought the stock, and they also about the right to do the to, to build the canal, <coughs> and they decided to build a log back canal instead of a sea level canal, which was really a very intelligent uh, idea because a sea level canal through the to Panama would have been catastrophic for the environment and for many other reasons. But uh, <coughs> these were the type of ships that were moving then. Uh, the canal was really designed uh, with the log side to move military vessels. And the largest military vessel, which was the USS Texas, I understand, was really the vessel that uh, was uh, uh, used for the model for the design of the log side. But it took many, many, many years of shipping, commercial shipping, to evolve to the size of the existing log. <coughs> the construction of that canal had a lot of impact in, in the world economy. Initially, it was mainly U.S., because when the canal was built, of course, trade with the rest of the world was very little. And uh, what the canal was doing, it was helping the U.S. move trade from one coast to the other. And at the same time, it was also good for defense of the U.S., because you could have the military vessels not necessarily uh, have to go all the way around the, the continent to, to, if it was needed for one of the coasts. But since then, uh, more than a million vessels have transited. And you can see the amount of cargo that has moved to the canal. So the canal has facilitated trade, which is really the way we want to put it. And uh, it has also helped, after the Second World War, uh, evolve globalization. I mean, globalization really uh, couldn't have taken place if you didn't have canals or if you didn't have the containers, for instance. Of course, there are other things like information systems and technology that have also helped globalization. globalization. But one of the uh, things that you have to take into account when you look at or think of canals is that they also help uh, competitiveness of some trade. I mean, 
this particular case of the Panama Canal it has helped the, the uh, American competitiveness with regard to the rest of the world. Uh, here you can see the statistics that go back to the beginning of the, of the inauguration of the existing canal. And as you can see, uh, in, in red is the transit, the number of transits, and in, in yellow is the tonnage. So what that, that tells you is that transits have not grown. Uh, it was right after the 70s when the old crisis that came about. Uh, but tonnage has, and, and you can see in the little tips how that has really happened. And what we have really is an evolution and growth of the average vessel price of transit. Uh, this, of course, is because it is uh, cheaper. It is uh, the economies of scale that the larger ships bring to trade uh, are, of course, taken into consideration. And you can see also technology, specialization of the ship. We no longer have only one ship type, as we had when the canal was initially constructed. We now have uh, seven, ten different types of ships that are specialized for the type of trade that they move. What you see in the, in, the, in the circle there, and this is quite important because this is almost in the last decade, what you see is really how globalization took off once China entered the WTO. And that little dip is the impact of the economic crisis that we have just gone through. Now, everybody agrees, and I'm not going to dwell into this, uh, uh, globalization really has been the, the key to increase in exports and, of course, increase in world investment as capital moves freely. And that should eventually generate more growth and development. In many of American economies, that part of the question is really what is not really taking place. You have a lot of growth, but not enough development. That means that the money is ending in some group only, and the gap between the rich and the poor are, are, is, is growing, even though globalization's uh, initial purpose was really to reduce poverty. In ma many cases, it's not happening. What we are going to pay attention to in this presentation is really the impact of globalization in the supply chain. Because as, as production moves and manufacturing moves all over the world, of course, that then impacts its transport. It, it impacts how you move the cargo from origin to destination. Because at the end of the day, uh, the transaction is finished when the goods are in the hands of the consumer. So anything you do, and you know, everybody talks about how uh, e-commerce is, 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 is changing things and the way that people buy and people at the end of the day, if the good doesn't arrive, the transaction doesn't take place. So if, with e-commerce, all you're doing is even making it more complicated. Because the, 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 the supply chain now has to uh, be able to reach the consumer fast, very fast, low cost. But the, the biggest word here is reliable, in a, in a, in a very reliable manner. Now, of course, the increase in transport has really been in all modes of transport, but mainly <coughs> shipping. Uh, this gives you an idea of, of how this has evolved from uh, the days in 19, just 1995. This was Toyota's supply chain. It was very simple. Everything was done in Japan, and it was you know either the cars or the parts were going only to uh, one destination. Nowadays. Their supply chain is from all over to all over. You know, parts are really moving from all over the globe. They have more than 250 ports where they do work. Uh, so that kind of 